Hello there, Muscombe History Group channel calling again. And this time we are presenting the Battle of Jutland, 1916. This is a three-parter and part one is called The Openings. Most people who know me know that for about 70 years now I've been wargaming collecting models and fighting wars with various scales. But perhaps what m many people don't know is that I can field both sides for the Battle of Jutland in tiny little ships like this one. Need a big area to play on, but I've got the ships to put every single ship that was at Jutland down on the floor. The tradition of Jutland goes back to 1805, when Nelson won the Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson's victory annihilates the French and Spanish fleets and leaves Britain as the undisputed ruler of the waves for the next hundred or so years. The technologies that Nelson used were wooden ships, powered by wind being caught in the sails, with many broadside cannons sticking out of gun ports, firing solid shot. That made the ships hard to sink. Wooden ships, cannonballs, you have to fire a lot to do any damage. The ship killers are fire and explosives, as Nelson proved at the Battle of the Nile when the flagship Lorient blew up. Then came new technologies, steam power, ironclads, and later iron and steel constructed ships, and turreted guns. The first time that these were seen was at Hampton Roads, in the first battle of ironclad steamships. The USS Monitor and the CSS Virginia, which was laid down as a frigate Merrimack, the USS Monitor is also the world's first turreted ship, but still firing solid round shot that bounced off the iron cladding. The next technology step was exploding shells fired from bigger and bigger muzzle loaded and then breech loaded guns. Soon, the battle fleets of the world were building steam-powered iron ships with large explosive shells being fired from guns set in turrets and smaller guns set in broadside casements. After the 1870 fleet review, Queen Victoria's Parliament adopted what was called the Two Power Policy. What this meant was that her navy should be greater than the next two navies added together. Kaiser Wilhelm II had always been envious of his grandmother's fleet, despite the fact that she had made him a full admiral of the fleet when he was younger. From 1881 to 1910, Germany had built a battleship fleet to rival everyone except Britain. The Kaiser wanted Tirpitz to build a modern navy on which to grow an empire, giving Germany a place in the sun. A hundred years after Trafalgar, it was modern ships that fought in the Battle of Tsushima Straits. This was in 1905. The battle was fought after the Russian Baltic fleet steamed halfway around the world to avenge the sinking by the Japanese of the Russian Far East fleet that was anchored in Port Arthur. But Japan then totally smashed the Russian Baltic fleet, using only their heaviest guns at ranges out to 15,000 yards. At this time, Royal Navy gunners 
trained at only 5,000 yards. The 1897 Spithead Review had also been disrupted by Mr. Parsons' steam yacht Turbinia, outrunning every Royal Naval vessel and demonstrating the advantages of turbine power. Turbines were inherently faster than reciprocating engines, so attack boats and smaller ships got faster. And in the early 1900s, turbines are being fitted to larger and larger ships. By 1904, Jackie Fisher orders a new battleship that was planned with turbine power to push it along at more than 20 knots. Jackie Fisher's first Sea Lord's all big gun ship is HMS Dreadnought. This is a new type of battleship, displacing around 21,000 tonnes and able to cruise at 21 knots with 10 12-inch shell-firing guns and massive armour protection. In 1906, Dreadnought is commissioned as the most powerful naval ship in the world and starts a new naval arms race. Dreadnought defines the future for all the world's battle fleets. New battleships were built as Dreadnoughts, and earlier battleships were simply called pre-Dreadnoughts, which meant that they were old-fashioned. Britain, Germany, France, USA, Italy, Austria and Japan all set out to launch as many Dreadnoughts as they could possibly afford. The term Dreadnought will apply to all modern battleships until well into the 1930s. So influential was Jackie Fisher's initial design. Germany sets about building a Dreadnought Navy at great speed. By 1912, the Two Powers Act became too expensive for Britain and was changed so that Britain now simply had to have more dreadnoughts than Germany. And when the Germany laid down four keels, the British public outcry was, we want eight and we won't wait. Generally, the German dreadnought ships were a little slower than their British counterparts and were not so heavily armed but their armour was better, and their damage control was much, much better. The fighting ships in 1914 were the Dreadnoughts, the Pre-Dreadnoughts, and the Battle Cruisers. A Battle Cruiser was a Dreadnought with fewer guns, less armour, and able to travel more quickly so they were used to scout for the battle fleets and also to be able to attack and engage anything that wasn't bigger than themselves. Armoured cruisers were a sort of leftover from the pre-dreadnought days and were the sort of ships that went visiting foreign ports when we wanted to send a gunboat and a whole range of light cruisers which were usually used for passing messages travelling around the British Empire, generally speaking, scouting and observing for the larger fleet. And a new type of ship called Torpedo Boat Destroyers. Capital ships near to shores could be attacked by very fast motor torpedo boats, MTBs, armed with Whitehead's new motorised torpedoes. The battle fleet had to be protected by fast torpedo boat destroyers, armed with 3-inch and 4-inch quick-firing guns. Soon, these fast TBDs as fleet ships were also armed with torpedoes to attack capital ships. 
they simply became known as destroyers and later carried depth charges and mines as well as their guns and torpedoes so they could effectively destroy anything the germans also had 48 submarines in 1914 but only 20 of these were operational the british had 74 submarines although many were all earlier models the new explosive mines was a terrible threat to both sides a single mine from 1914 onwards could sink a capital ship or an ocean-going liner but events in July 1914 mean the Kaiser's War will start on land since 1905 the German army had a plan to defeat France neutralize the Royal Navy and fight Russia only if necessary the plan depended on fast railway mobilization of the German armies the Schlieffen plan was devised by General Alfred von Schlieffen five German armies swept through Belgium and down through France to encircle Paris and outflank the French army the French army then would surrender in 90 days the German fleet would then deploy on the Belgian and French Channel ports to threaten British sea trade three German armies would redeploy to the east making five armies on the Russian front Russia would then sue for peace in August of 1914 the Kaiser's Navy was not ready to fight the Royal Navy at sea seven German armed merchant cruisers were caught in neutral ports and interned until the end of the war the high seas fleet was still inferior to the Royal Navy's home fleet vessels and whilst the British were not ready for war they quickly organized themselves this is a picture of the great fleet assembled at Spithead and if you notice the date the review is July the 18th 1914 the Grand Fleet was kept on alert and Royal Navy ships were sent straight to their war stations and were there by August of 1914 what was the balance of power in 1914 in dreadnoughts the Royal Navy had 20 German Navy had 14 in pre-dreadnoughts the Royal Navy had 48 the German Navy had 24 and in battle cruisers the Royal Navy had 9 the German Navy had 6 armored cruisers 62 for the Royal Navy 24 for Germany light cruisers 54 for the Royal Navy 24 for Germany and destroyers 270 for the Royal Navy and 138 for Germany but the Royal Navy's global responsibilities meant early setbacks whilst protecting the trade routes but the German raiders were soon hunted down and destroyed or isolated when laying out the board for the home base the central area was the North Sea the Royal Navy quickly secures the Dover Straits so that they can deploy the British Expeditionary Force into France the Harwich patrol with Admiral Tarwit secures the southern passage from the North Sea 
The German High Seas Fleet occupies the Jade Estuary and each end of the Kiel Canal and all of the Baltic ports. Admiral von Ingenol and Admiral Hipper are in command. The Germans expected a close blockade after the style of Nelson, but modern weapons made this too risky. The British actually seal the entire North Sea by blockading from Scotland to Norway. The main dreadnought bases were at Scarpa Flow and Invergordon. The battle cruisers were based at Rosyth in the Firth of Forth. Free dreadnoughts, cruisers, destroyers and submarines were primarily based at Harwich. Then various heavy and lighter units were based at the Humber, the Nore, Dover and Portsmouth, Portland, Devonport and Queenstown in Ireland to defend the English western approaches. Admiral Sir John Jellicoe is Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet. Based at Scarpa Flow with the main dreadnought battle squadrons, Jellicoe is cautious and thorough. He is a protégé of Sir John Fisher, the first Sea Lord, and is a vastly experienced Sea Officer. His second in command is Rear Admiral Sir David Beatty, commanding the battle cruiser squadrons in Rosyth. He is brave and impetuous, and is also an accomplished rider to hounds, which is why his family seat is Brooksby Hall, near to Melton Mowbray. He's better connected than most naval officers to the political establishment. At first, the Germans operate inside the blockade with hit and run raids on the English northeast coast. Grimsby, Scarborough, Whitby, Teesside, and Tyneside are all attacked. But these raids call for rapid retreat if the battle cruisers were not to be trapped against a foreign shore. This tended to defeat the purpose of the raids of luring the British ships into a trap of the superior forces at sea. And the loss of civilian life and damage to civilian property cost Germany in bad propaganda. Grand Admiral von Ingenau had a better idea and orders Hipper's cruisers to threaten the fishing fleet on the Dogger Bank. But Beatty was already positioned and intercepted Hipper's attack. The outcome was the Battle of Dogger Bank which is a marginal victory for the British. It could have been better. The battlecruiser Blücher was sunk, but signalling errors had allowed most of the German fleet to escape. Beatty's flag officer, Lieutenant Seymour, was never able to cope and should have been replaced. Signalling errors will also play a part in the Battle of Jutland. Signals were passed by signal hoists, that is to say, running coded coloured flags up to the masthead to create visual signals from ship to ship. 
but visibility when following a ship into action at this time can be poor. Ship-to-ship -ship signals could use semaphore flags or by signal lamps which should have been used to repeat signals anyway. Often a destroyer or a cruiser would run alongside the battle line to repeat the signals from the Admiral. From this position, the whole fleet can read the signal more or less at the same time. Radio was also available in ships and on land bases, but it was bulky, unreliable and easily intercepted. It had a long range, but could be intercepted by every receiving station within that range that was tuned into the right signal. Coding and decoding radio messages also took time. Radio was usually used for strategic signals and to send messages over the horizon. The British used radio far less than the Germans, trusting the Nelson tradition and also having control of the telegraph lines for all strategic messages. In 1916, the Royal Navy had five new Queen Elizabeth class super dreadnoughts of latest design and the best ships in the world. Four were present at Jutland as the 5th Battle Squadron under Admiral Evan Thomas. The Super Dreadnoughts had eight 15-inch guns and 26 knots for their speed with up to 13 inches of armour protection. And the following table compares North Sea naval strengths And what you can see is that the British outnumber Germany by 150 ships to 99, more or less three to every two. The Germans also had around 14 submarines, Unterseebolts, in the North Sea, covering British harbours. But they failed to locate any Royal Navy ships before Jutland. But it's the dreadnoughts and battle cruisers that are going to matter in this fight, and the British superiority here is almost two to one, with 28 dreadnoughts against 16 and nine battle cruisers against five, a total of 37 capital ships for the British and 21 capital ships for the Germans. Beatty also had HMS Engadin attached to his battlecruiser fleet. This is the first aircraft carrier ever to operate in a fleet action, though it's not quite what we see as an aircraft carrier today. You can perhaps see the aeroplane on the stern of the Engadin in this photograph. It's just been pulled out of the hangar which is the large structure in front of it. The aeroplane will then be winched into the water using a crane and will then taxi away from the ship and using the water as a runway will take off and go on its flight. It will then come back, locate the Engadin, land on the sea, taxi up to the ship, a hoist will be attached and it will be pulled back on board. Engadin's seaplane would be first to locate the enemy fleet at Jutland, but in the event, the aeroplane did not have time to return to the ship, land on the water and report before the action was joined by other ships. Graf von Hipper, 
commanded the German battle cruisers from 1914. And again, as with previous actions, he was to be the bait in a trap. Grand Admiral von Scheer is promoted Commander-in-Chief of the High Seas Fleet after Admiral Ingenol was replaced by Admiral Paul and Admiral Paul dies rather suddenly of cancer. Von Scheer is looking for a limited victory that would even up the sides in the North Sea. The German plan was for Hipper's battle cruisers to harass the Danish shipping and draw Beatty out of Rosyth. When Admiral Beatty's battle cruisers had located Hipper, he would lead them south onto the main force of the High Seas Fleet commanded by von Scheer. Hipper and Scheer would then destroy the Royal Navy's battlecruiser squadrons before Jellicoe could join in. Such a victory would weaken the North Sea blockade on Germany. The victory could remove the North Sea blockade on Germany entirely. Germany will then have access to world trade and her home front would change significantly. Germany could even win the war. It is said that two things count very highly in war, communications and intelligence. As it happens, Britain had a considerable strategic advantage in both. Most secret telegraph communications from Europe to the rest of the world went through Britain to get to the final booster station in Cornwall. Or they went immediately past Britain via channel submarine telegraph cables. It was fairly simple for British military intelligence to monitor and or control communications by telegraph. So radio became the option for Germany and interception was made even easier. The British Admiralty had established a Royal Naval Intelligence Unit known as Room 40, which had been set up very early in the war and could read almost all the German naval coded radio traffic using captured and decoded German code books. Room 40 had a clear idea of what the Germans were planning, but giving Jellicoe too much information might show that the German code is compromised and they would change their codes. The great enemy of wide communication of the enemy's messages is who on your side should know what. Too much information might allow the enemy to guess the codes were compromised and they'd simply change them and ruin the intelligence. This was a major problem at Jutland. The Admiralty also had a radio listening station at the Victorian seaside resort of Hunstanton. Radio traffic picked up here was sent to room 40, but they also knew the Germans were up to something by the sheer volume of radio traffic for the German fleets. This intelligence is less secret on your side as this is general information of which an enemy will also be aware. This idea was actually used against Germany in World War II 
when a fictitious U.S. Army led by General Patton, based in East Anglia, was made up almost entirely of radio traffic. The Admiralty Room 40 did not have immediate access to the Grand Fleet. Communication had to go through many filters, and this took time. An early example of this is the location of DK, which was the harbour-based identification of Admiral von Scheer. But when von Scheer was at sea, his code changed and DK was transferred to an administration office ashore. A Royal Naval officer who knew a little bit about the codes went in to ask the Room 40 people, where is DK? Admiral von Scheer was sailing to intercept Beatty at this time, so when the officer asked where is DK, he was told, in harbour. This meant that Beatty was never made aware of the High Seas Fleet presence until he actually bumped into it. Jellico in Iron Duke sails eastward towards the Jutland Peninsula. Von Scheer has hardly left harbour when Wellington is already on station. Beatty comes out of Rosyth to intercept the enemy fleet and almost accidentally bumped into Hipper's battle squadrons. So far, so good. Jellicoe has brought the Grand Fleet out of Scarpa Flow and Invergordon to wait for Beatty to lead the battle cruisers, if not the High Seas Fleet as a whole, to the north. Meantime, Beatty's battle cruisers located Hipper, but Beatty chases Hipper to the south, where the High Seas Fleet commanded by Scheer, is waiting. Beatty could still be greatly outnumbered and trapped between Hipper's battle cruisers and von Scheer's high seas fleet. Even with the British intelligence advantage, the German plan could still be working. The German plan is to seriously damage Beatty's battle cruisers, and it's looking like a real possibility. Can Beatty's battle cruisers turn north and outrun the high seas fleet commanded by Admiral Scheer and bring it onto the guns of Jellicoe's battle fleet of dreadnoughts? Or will Hipper and von Scheer damage Beatty's fleet even more seriously? leaving Jellicoe to cruise to the south, finding that Beatty's battle cruisers have been destroyed, and the High Seas Fleet has returned to port. Even a small victory over the battle cruisers could break the blockade on Germany and change the course of the war. To see what happens next at the Battle of Jutland in 1916, go to part two, the Daylight Engagements. Thanks for watching. See you there.